Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This week, our nation celebrates Public Service Recognition Week. Each year, the first week of May is designated as a time to honor the women and men who serve our, na our nation as federal, state, county, and local government employees. I want to take this opportunity to recognize and thank all public employees in Marion and in our uh, neighboring communities and the county and throughout our region. These people work hard to provide our residents with excellent services and opportunities to enjoy a great quality of life. And these public employees have been working very hard during these challenging times under less than ideal circumstances to protect people's health while maintaining high quality services that we all need. So thank you uh, to all public employees for all you do. And it's especially fitting uh, at this time to recognize our county emergency management team as well as the public health officials and all those involved in the COVID-19 response for all you're doing to guide our region through this crisis. So this is the ninth week of our emergency response reports to the community. I wanna thank everyone for tuning in to these reports and thank all residents of, the, of Lynn County for their continued patience and vigilance in this situation. I understand it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy for any of us, but we must not become complacent about doing what we can to protect ourselves as well as the health of others while we go about our daily lives. Some counties around us are opening, but please remember that Lynn County is not opening. Please don't travel to those other counties unless you absolutely must. Stay safe by staying smart. We all want to do the things that are important to us, but we must be smart in our actions. We have a shared responsibility to each other. By now, we should all be familiar with the risks. You may feel fine, but can carry the virus to others. And we should all be familiar with the guidelines given to us by our county health department. When you and I follow these guidelines, you are protecting me and I'm protecting you. This is a long-term game. Our cities and the county are planning for how things will operate when we are able to safely open and how we will operate with the virus in our community. That doesn't mean back to business as usual. Remember the virus can't spread without people. So everyone must do their part by policing themselves and doing the right things to help avoid contracting it and spreading it to others. Again, I understand this isn't easy, but we are stronger than this crisis and I believe braver than our fears. We will only get through this by pulling together and doing our part. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Heather Metter, and I'm the supervisor for the Clinical Services Branch at Lynn County Public Health. As of 1 p.m. today, there are currently 749 cases of COVID-19 in Lynn County. There have been 51 deaths and 464 individuals have recovered. Since our last press conference, a fifth long-term care facility has met the state's definition of an outbreak. Lynn County Public Health will continue to track and follow up with outbreaks identified at Lynn County long-term care facilities. Several facilities are moving towards recovery. Cottage Grove Place in Cedar Rapids is the most recent long-term care facility the state, to meet the state's outbreak definition. At Cottage Grove, five staff and residents have tested positive and one resident has died. At Heritage Specialty Care, 113 staff and residents have tested positive, 24 residents have died, and 85 staff and residents have recovered. 
at Lynn Manor, 22 staff and residents have tested positive, six residents have died, and 16 staff and residents have recovered. At Manor Care Health Services, 37 residents and staff have tested positive, three residents have died, and two of the ill have recovered. At St. Luke's Living Center West in Cedar Rapids, 52 residents and staff have tested positive. There are six deaths associated with this outbreak and six of the ill have recovered. The rate of cases being reported in Lynn County has slowed due to large scale mass testing within local workplaces being completed. However, we still see new cases in our county each day. Over half of the cases identified in Lynn County over the weekend are connected to community spread and are not linked to an identified outbreak. This is a clear indication that we still have work to do to slow the spread of the virus. It was two to three weeks ago that there were religious holidays and the weather began to get nicer. We noticed during the same time period that there was a decrease in appropriate social distancing and that family and friends had been gathering together. This is important because this is about the same time period that it takes to be able to spread the virus to others after being exposed. Therefore, we are saddened, but not surprised, to see an increase in community spread of COVID-19. We have been warning that not abiding by the social distancing guidelines would increase the spread of infection. In Lynn County, we have not reached our peak. Despite projection models attempting to forecast when the peak will occur, I cannot tell you with any confidence when that peak will happen. We don't know. We won't know until it's happened and we are on the other side of that trend line. It has now been more than eight weeks since community spread was first identified in Iowa on March 14th, which resulted in a series of closures in our community. Since then, our lives have changed drastically and we all want to return to normal. We miss our loved ones that we are not able to see and we long for a return to normalcy. However, it is important to remember that even as things reopen and the weather gets nice, everyone must continue to practice social distancing. In Lynn County, you still should not gather in groups of 10 or more people. And when you are around other people, maintain six feet of distance between each other. If you are in a setting when you are unsure if the six feet of distance can be maintained, such as a grocery store, you should wear a cloth facial covering to protect the people around you. Every interaction you have may be a potential contact to COVID-19. If you become infected, you may have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. There are people you will expose unknowingly and unwillingly. For example, you go outside and you talk to your neighbor next door. The neighbor returns home to be with his elderly mother that lives with him. His elderly mother now contracts COVID-19 and then dies. Or perhaps you will pass it on to your daughter's boyfriend who then brings the virus home to his brother with underlying health issues. And the brother becomes ill and ends up on a ventilator at the hospital. The actions you take today will not show up immediately. It will take two to three weeks before the impact of your actions are felt by others. When you decide not to follow the guidelines of the medical community and public health that we keep pleading for you to observe, you are putting your community at risk. It's up to all of us to take individual responsibility to protect our community. And we can do this. We have sensible Iowa values. 
We take care of of each other. We celebrate together, we cry together, and we are all tired. We all want to return to life as it was before COVID-19. We want to go back to work. We want to see our friends. And we can get there. However, we must be patient. We must take care of each other. We must be humble. We must practice kindness. And we must do what we can to protect each other. We will make it to the end of this marathon together, one step at a time. Thank you. Okay, this is the end of our prepared remarks for today, and we do have a few, uh, or time for a few questions, excuse me. Um, For our media partners, please indicate if you'd like to be entered in the queue. I do have two uh, or three people entered in the queue now. In addition to Mayor Abel Asli and Heather uh, Metter, Dr. Timothy Quinn is also available for questions today. The first question comes from Travis Breeze at KWWL. Uh, Travis, would you like to go ahead with your question? Yes, please. Uh, Hi, my question is for Heather. Um, Heather, it's not a huge discrepancy, but um, you just reported 749 uh, total cases in the county. And right now on uh, Iowa Department of Public Health site, they have 757. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on why you think that discrepancy is there. Um, I mean, are you... Are you sending your numbers to them? Yep. So Travis, thank you for the question. Travis is asking about a discrepancy between the numbers that I presented and what's on the Iowa Department of Public Health website. Travis, my numbers were from earlier today, so that might be part of the discrepancy, but we have also noticed some other discrepancies. So we are working with the Iowa Department of Public Health. They actually report their numbers to us. So so when someone is diagnosed with COVID-19, that information goes to the county of residents. So we are trying to find out, is there actually an issue there or how are they doing their reporting and where are they getting their numbers from? So I don't have a firm answer for you right now as we continue to find out what that discrepancy could be. But also uh, please remember that my numbers were from 1 p.m. today. Okay, thanks, Okay, Heather. Thank you, Travis. Uh, um, yeah. Can you say if you have had so i know we're we're kind of um we're saying that there's been talk of the test iowa site um in lynn county uh, possibly coming may 11th i was wondering if you could confirm that uh, and say have you had um have you been having direct conversations uh with state officials about about the setup of that site I have not had any conversations with state officials. Um, Others may have, but I have not. And we would uh, encourage you to contact the governor's office directly for any questions regarding uh, Test Iowa, as the governor's office is the one that's doing all the planning and implementation of Test Iowa. Okay, thanks. Uh, That was the last question I had for you. I also have one uh, for Dr. Quinn. Um, Would you like me to go ahead with that, Kaylin, or I can wait? Thank you, Travis. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Quinn, we have seen, um, and first of all, I'm sorry, I, I'm not familiar with you uh, yet, so if you could, when you start, um, say what hospital uh, you work at. Um, but we've seen, I'm, I'm looking at a report from um, Johns Hopkins University right now uh, that talks about uh, possible long term effects from COVID 19 uh, in a person's lungs. Uh, even after they may have defeated the virus, um, possibly having, you know, having trouble breathing for for months after that. Uh, I was wondering if this is anything that you had seen, um, yeah, in in your time studying the virus uh, so far. So, uh, uh, Dr. Timothy Quinn, I'm the Chief of Clinical Operations at Mercy Hospital, and I'm a family practice doctor. Um, So, the question you're asking, I think what we haven't seen the after effects of this. There's a lot of speculation in the medical community as to what sort of long-term monitoring these patients uh, will need to undergo. So it's largely an unanswered question at this point. Um, would you, could you say if, um, 
do you think it's a stretch or I mean could you say for sure does having COVID would that make you um, more susceptible to getting pneumonia in the future? Um, I, w I don't know that I would go that far. I think what they're probably doing are connecting some dots between uh, s similar lung illnesses, uh, 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 inflammatory conditions in the lung, and connecting those dots. But what we also don't know yet is what degree of pre-existing lung disease some of these people might have had uh, that the Johns Hopkins uh, thing is talking about. Okay, thanks. And thanks, everybody, for letting me uh, ask a couple of questions. I am done. Okay, our next uh, question comes from Michaela Ram at the Gazette. Michaela, go ahead with your question. Hey, thank you. Uh, this question is for Heather. Um, Heather, I wondered if you could say whether Lynn County Public Health is looking at other long-term care facilities with COVID cases, but who don't meet the criteria for an outbreak? Thank you for the question, Michaela. So Michaela is wondering if we're looking at other long-term care facilities that do not meet the definition of an outbreak. And we are looking at all long-term care facilities. So again, um, at Lynn County Public Health, there is a survey that we ask for the long-term care facilities to complete daily. On that survey, it talks about personal protective equipment. It talks about staffing. It talks about the residents, how many residents are ill, how many staff are ill, how many residents have been diagnosed with COVID-19, how many staff members may have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And as soon as we start to see any indication, regardless of what the state's definition of an outbreak is, we start contacting that facility immediately and start to work with them and address the issues that they're seeing. We don't wanna wait till a facility meets that definition. We can't release that information to the general public until they meet that definition but we try to intervene as quickly as possible so that we can help to reduce the burden of infection within that facility. Was there anything else I could help answer for you, Michaela? It does. Um, and to follow up with that then, you know, once there is an outbreak in a long-term care facility, the case counts seem to, to increase quite quickly. Um, you know, I, I wondered if you could speak on why that is and, and whether there is anything that can be done to prevent that or if that's just sort of the nature of this virus and, and how it moves through these facilities. So, so Michaela's asking about why we see such large case counts within a facility. And unfortunately, with COVID-19, what we're finding is once we find it, it's almost too late. It's already spread to many people. COVID-19 is highly transmissible is what we're seeing. It's very easy to spread between individuals. And so unfortunately, by the time that people start to display symptoms, we just talked about a little bit earlier, how it can take two to three weeks, sometimes before you start to see things, the incubation period. So the time it takes for that virus to start to show any symptoms um, can be up to 14 days. So unfortunately, that virus may have been spreading around before we start to see any symptoms. Again, that's why we start to look for any type of illness, not just COVID-19. That's part of that survey that we do. We're trying to intervene as quickly as we can as soon as we start to see something uh, in that long-term care facility. All right, and just um, one more question for you, Heather, if that's okay. Um, the governor mentioned today, and I know this was specific to the strike teams that the state is sending out, but they mentioned today that they will be testing staff at long-term care facilities um, ahead of time in order to prevent an outbreak. I wondered if Lynn County, um, you know, now that we're seeing a fifth outbreak, if, if there's uh, consideration maybe doing something similar? We have talked to the state about this. The strike teams are wonderful for counties that are smaller, that don't have... Um, the same robust nature to, as Lynn County does to address those issues. So what we are asking is that for long-term care facilities, if they would need testing, that they reach out to us. We are not um, looking to bring strike teams into Lynn County for that, because if there is an issue, if something's going on, we have the resources within our county to address it. Okay, thank you, Heather. Yep, thank um, you. Yep. I also have a question for Dr. Quinn. Okay. Uh, Dr. Quinn, we've been seeing some national reports that uh, there are patients who are avoiding medical care or emergency care um, because of their fears of COVID-19. I wondered if that's something we're seeing locally or if that's a concern of local hospitals. Yeah, it's definitely a concern. Uh, during, you know, we, we live in a community and a state where 
Uh, people actually do an incredibly good job of trying to stay at home, doing the things that we've asked them to do, and it uh, certainly helps to reduce the spread of infection. But the downside of that is I think we've been, they've been so effective in staying at home that then we start worrying about do people avoid uh, appropriate medical care when they actually need it. And the answer to that is probably yes. I think we're, we're consistent with what's going on nationwide, which are people are staying at home when they probably should be going to the emergency room. And uh, both hospitals uh, have done an, a, a very effective job at separating areas of the institutions that are uh, COVID free uh, to make sure that we can care for acute things like strokes or heart attacks or uh, traumas or things that uh, otherwise would be delayed. Okay, thank you, Dr. Quinn. Thank you, Michaela, for your questions. Um, we will take questions from Shannon Moody with Iowa News Now next. Shannon, go ahead with your question. Hi, this is actually Mitch Fick with Iowa News Now. Shannon's here as well. Um, Dr. Quinn, this is a little off the beaten path, but uh, I know that some anesthesiologists at, at Mercy as well as some other local uh, facilities have been working with modern piping on prototype manifolds for ventilators that would essentially let the ventilators uh, serve two patients instead of one, assuming that the patients have similar lung capacities or same size and what have you. Uh, I don't know if you can speak specifically about that, that research and, and those efforts, but even just uh, looking at ways to use resources as efficiently as possible, uh, if not locally, but maybe being able to provide templates for places that are struggling with ventilators and things like that. Yeah, again, I, th I think we've been in a really fortunate situation where we have not had some of the worst case scenarios that we uh, initially worried about. Uh, we didn't become a New York, for example. There are places in the country where the research is going on where they would have multiple patients ventilated from one machine. We're, we're not one of them, nor it's been a backup to the backup to the backup plan if we ever came to that. And Modern Piping uh, came forward and said, hey, we can certainly help with that. And they put together a a prototype, but it really hasn't been uh, a, a source of uh, a plan for us locally because we have been in the, the nice position of having plenty of ventilators uh, statewide uh, and, and, and certainly in the community as well. Um, the, the thing to remember is that the, you know, these are incredibly uh, complex devices and, and the complexity for each individual patient is, is, de is deep. Um, so we would likely sh send people to different communities or try to acquire more ventilators before going to that sort of plan. That's it, thank you. That wasn't, a, that wasn't off the beaten path question. <laughs> okay, it sounds like those are the questions from Shannon and Mitch working together there. Uh, it, the next question uh, can come from Mary, Mary Green. Mary, go ahead with your question. Hi, my question is for Heather. Um, we are getting a lot of calls and messages this weekend, folks reaching out to us about the big car cruise that was happening down First Avenue. And it's kind of a mixed bag of some folks saying, hey, this is a great way for the community to get together and show kind of that community spirit um, in a safe way. And we have a lot of folks who are also concerned saying that there were a lot of people getting together in a mass gathering and they were nervous that this was unsafe um, for community health. So just mm -hmm. kind of wanted to get some um, guidance from you all on that. So I know there's another one planned for this weekend and for similar events to this, um, where folks are just itching to get out of the house. Um, is this something that is safe and a, a way for folks to still get together? Or is this the type of thing that can set the community back a couple weeks? So thank you for your question, Mary. So uh, to paraphrase uh, what Mary had asked is about a, an event with cars and people trying to do a social distancing car fest where they were all in their cars going up and down the street. Um, yes, if you were in your cars and you stayed in your cars and went up and down the street and did not get out, that would meet social distancing guidelines. However, that's pretty hard because what happens is you're seeing people that you haven't seen for a long time and you're excited to see them and all of a sudden the parking lot's filled with people that are not social distancing that are communing together. And we are now having more than 10 people in a group, which in Lynn County, we are still supposed to have 10 or less in a group. So we are now no longer social distancing. People do not have cloth face mask on. 
and we now have the opportunity to spread infection. Despite wanting to do what was right, we now have the opportunity to spread infection amongst others. So it, it's both. Could you stay in your car, not get out of your car, go up and down the street? That, that would be appropriate. However, we're human. And as humans, we are social people. And we like to see each other, and we want to be together. So there are issues with that. So there are issues with people getting together in the parking lots, and it starts off with just one person talking to one person, but then somebody else comes over and somebody else comes over. And before you know it, you have a gathering of 25 to 50 people uh, talking and laughing and enjoying each other's company. But again, that puts the public at risk. And we won't see the ramifications of that for a few weeks once we get through that incubation period. So does that help to answer your question, Mary? Yes, it does. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I believe that concludes the questions that I was aware of. Is there anyone else on our phone line that has a question for our speakers today? It doesn't sound like it. Well, thank you for joining us again today. Um, that does conclude our press conference. Our next scheduled press conference will be Thursday, May 7th at 3.30. In summary of the cases for Lynn County to date, there are 749 cases, 51 deaths, and 464 individuals that have recovered. This is a reminder to please practice that social distancing, staying six feet away from others, stay home when you're sick, and wash your hands often. Stay safe and stay home. Thank you.